Hello and welcome to One to Grow On, a show where we dig into questions about agriculture and try to understand how food production impacts us and our world. My name is Hallie Casey and I studied and currently work in agriculture. And I'm Chris Casey, Hallie's dad. Each episode we pick an area of agriculture or food production to discuss. And this week we're focusing on plant propagation. All right. How do you propagate a plant? So many ways. So many ways. I mean, you plant it in the ground or you cut part of it off and splice it into another plant. Mm. And that's why speciation is, you know, all just made up nonsense. Cut, because cut. you can splice all the plants with each no, other and no. create new plants. <laughs> no. No? No. You can crossbreed them. And, yes. Okay. But the splicing isn't why speciation is nonsense. So we don't talk, we don't really call it splicing. We call it grafting. Okay. Uh, I mean, and you build, you basically build a plant, but it's like still two separate sides of a plant. So like, you can graft a potato and a tomato together, and what you have is a to- tomato or however you <laughs> right. <laughs> like the bottom part grows potatoes and the top part grows tomatoes. Tomato. Right. So, but, but, but it's, it's not a it's not a hybrid. Yeah, so it like grows and then it dies and that's like that's it. It's not going to like produce a new plant because you're not it's not in the genes. Basically what just happens is the tubes connect and so they can transport water and nutrients up and down the plant. Okay, cool. But that's not propagation. I mean it can be part of propagation, but that's not mostly what we're going to be talking about. So, uh peek behind the curtain. I taught this as a class. Big shout out to one of my previous students who took our listener survey. There you go. Hey, Melissa. Yeah, she'll know all of this information, hopefully. (laughs) Yeah, I taught a class called Plant Propagation, and I thought it would be fun to try and fit an entire semester into 35 minutes of podcast. And if you don't know all the information by now, Melissa, you should have paid more attention in class. Okay, we don't need to drag (laughs) Melissa on the podcast. (laughs) You know, I never paid attention in class, so... Melissa is an excellent student. I believe it. So we have sexual propagation and asexual propagation. So it's like hot or not. What? <laughs> plants that are that are hot for each other or plants that just don't care and do their own thing. No. <laughs> no, so like, okay. So we propagate plants to serve our own purposes, not necessarily to serve the plant's purposes. So most plants that we asexually propagate can propagate sexually, but there are reasons why we choose to asexually propagate it instead. Wow. Because plants, you know, are living beings that have sexual like cycles and reproduce via pollen and, you know, ovaries. And they Pistols create, and stamens. Yeah, and... they create seeds. And it's just like how many, many living things operate, including plants. Okay. Uh, I, when you say we choose to propagate them asexually, I feel like we're subjugating them to our will against their preferences, even though they're plants and they don't necessarily have preferences. I'm like, oh, we are bending these plants to our will. Yeah, we do that with most things. <laughs> that is true. That is true. We are humans. That is what we do. He sucks to suck. <laughs> Okay, I don't think we need to drag all of humanity in the show. No, I'm not dragging all of humanity. I'm like, sucks to suck to like all the other living plants. Like, maybe you should have thought about that and then become the dominant predator, you know, a- uh. apex species or whatever. So because they didn't work hard enough at evolution, they just have to deal. Yeah, I'm just saying. Yeah, okay. Seems like we got here and we're crushing it. I feel like that's a little heartless. Nothing's nothing's going wrong. We're all doing right. a great job. So yeah, so we have sexual propagation. We have asexual propagation. Sexual propagation meaning seeds. That's how we further that plant. So that can include things like seed breeding, which is where we grow plants for the purpose of trying to make a seed that will grow a better plant. Uh, Seed breeding, which we grow a seed for the purposes of trying to make a better plant. We, yeah, we, we grow a plant for the seed in hopes that that seed makes a better plant. We grow a plant for the seed. Oh, so we select for a particular plant that produces the best seeds. Yeah, basically. Okay. So Got like it. sometimes we have plants that are crossbreeds or like hybrids. And so in that, like you, we can be growing tomatoes, but if we're growing like seed tomatoes, then we're never growing those tomatoes really for the tomatoes. We're growing them to cross pollinate them and create tomato seed. Kind of like when your mom and I got together because 
we knew we would make the best children. Okay, gross. Gross. Gross, gross, gross. It's not gross. It's romantic. Gross. Gross. And sweet. No, that's not. It's not at all. Uh, all right. <laughs> so, fine, whatever. We're selecting plants to have better or more resilient seeds, or we're selecting them for some, you know, particular characteristic to qualify as whatever good is for what we need it. Right, right. Okay. We breed plants, and oftentimes when we do that, it's seed breeding that we do it for. Um, there are different components of a seed. You have the seed coat, you have the endosperm, the cotyledons, and the embryo. I feel like we've talked about this on the podcast before. Those are all words that I remember. Yeah. Cotyledon is the weirdest one. Yeah. I do remember you talking about it. Yeah. So like inside of the seed, there's like a little embryo, which is what the plant becomes. But there's also these cotyledons that become like what you first see when the little embryo pops up. It's like two or one leaves. They're not really leaves because they're inside of the seed. They're like a starchy reserve so that when the embryo starts to grow, it's able to like pull starches out. So it has energy. Um, This is helpful to understand the different parts of a seed because we sometimes we have to treat seed in order for it to grow. Are these what microgreens are? Yes, yes, oh, yes, yes, yes. I yes. remembered another thing. I'm that so happy been, for me. Yeah, that must have been when we talked about it. Yeah, if you want to go back, yep. we talked about microgreens on the last Superfood episode, Superfood 4, I think. We talked about microgreens and that involves talking about cotyledons. But around the seed is a seed coat. So sometimes when we are planting seeds in order to propagate a new plant, we have to treat the seeds because there is something that makes it like impossible for the embryo to actually grow. So we do things like imbibing the seed, which is where you soak them in water. Okay, so it's not about just getting them drunk. No, we don't get them drunk. Uh, we, we we can soak them in water by imbibing them. We can also stratify them, which is when we like put them in the freezer for a couple of days, and that will like break a seed's dormancy. Um, or we can also what we call scarify the seeds, which is where you basically like file them down with like a nail file or something. I'm so confused right now. Okay, why? So, I mean, I'm accepting what you're telling me, right? And we're talking about getting the seed to start growing. Mm-hmm. One of the ways is soaking them in water. Yes. So, you know, they don't drown, obviously. They just like the water. And the other way you said is freezing them, mm-hmm. which I associate freezing with going dormant. Not with triggering production. Right. So basically what you're mimicking there is if you're a plant and you like produce fruit in the springtime and it's lovely and it's warm outside and the seeds go in the ground, you don't really want those seeds to start growing until the next spring usually, right? So you're basically mimicking a wintertime period. So they have a freezing and then when that freeze ends, they're like, okay, great. It's warm now. I will start to grow because if it was still cold or if it was still warm and there hadn't been cold, these seeds are like, wait, it's going to get cold and it's going to get rough for me. I got to wait it out. The freezer mimics the weather. Yes. Dang. For the okay. seeds. The seeds are not that smart. They can't notice that it's inside of a freezer. Fair enough. And then taking a nail file to them. Yeah, scarification. So this can also be like sometimes we just like put them in like a big tumbler and we like tumble them around so that the seed coats get scratched. Like a rock polisher. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but basically this is mimicking being eaten and then pooped. Whoa. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes you actually have to ferment seeds to make them grow, which is wild. Um, but yeah, like usually if you have some kind of seed with a really hard seed coat. It's either meant to be like a mammal grabs it and then like chews it and then spits it back out or it goes through the digestive system and there are a lot of acids in there that can break that seed coat down and then it's ready to be. Got it. Okay. So the nail file mimics the process by which the seed coat gets broken down. There are seeds which in the wild go through a fermentation process before they start growing. I mean, that's, that's, or is that scar them as well? Yeah. So fermentation is kind of similar. That's basically mimicking going through a digestive tract where you okay. are exposed to a All lot right. of like high acids. Cool. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that is most of what I have for sexual propagation. We can talk about asexual next, which is the wild stuff. Sexual is the most common and the cheapest, but that's, I mean, there's tons more to talk about, but that's the basics. If you're gardening, always check your seed packet in case you need to imbibe, scarify, or stratify your seeds. So it's like the opposite of the human world where the 
Sexual reproduction is the wild stuff. No, Dad. If we asexually propagate humans, that's the wild stuff. Uh, that's fair. That's a good point. I never thought about that. How would that look? I don't think that this podcast is the forum for that kind of speculation, but now I'm curious. I mean, cloning, I guess. Yeah, that's exactly cloning. Ex- precisely, exactly, yes. Wait, is asexual propagation in plants cloning? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. cool. <laughs> All right. Well... You know where things get really wild. Where? In the break. Hey, let's go. I have some excellent news. I would like to very much thank our very new, brand new, Starfruit patron, Patrick. Hello, Patrick. Welcome to our wonderful podcast family. Welcome, welcome. We are so happy to have you along with Starfruit patrons, Vikram, Lindsay, Mama Casey and Cheyenne. Thank you guys so much for all of your support. If you would like to talk with us, our amazing Starfruit patrons, all of the rest of the One to Grow On community, you can jump in our Discord group or our Facebook group where we are posting lots of memes and jokes and plant facts. Plant facts and plant questions. Plant questions, so many plant questions, lots of houseplant support, gardening support plant id all these wonderful things you can find at you can either go to one to grow on pod.com slash discord for the discord group or one to grow on pod.com slash group for the facebook group facts fun memes like dandelorians yes come join us we would love to talk with you also in march we're gonna do things a little differently march is national agriculture month here in the u.s and we are partnering up with three amazing food and farming podcasts to bring you a little bit of different content we're going to be airing some of their episodes so you can learn more about their shows and how amazing they are we're going to be talking about this a lot on social media so you can connect to other very cool people online who are talking about agriculture and food in very fun and interesting ways and doing amazing stuff. We're focusing on indie producers. So it's going to be a lot of people who would just, this is their passion, just like me and dad. um, And they really are trying to bring the very best stuff. So you can look forward to that. The next episode is technically just at the end of February, but that is when we will start. And then the two episodes in March will also be part of this. Until April, though, um, if you want to connect with us, we're going to be on social media, and we're going to be on our Discord and Facebook. So come join us, com slash Discord or slash group for the Discord and Facebook group, respectively. In April, we'll be back on the air. But now, it's back to the episode. Back to the episode. Dad, do you have a nature fact for us? I do. Ooh. All right, so the past few weeks, I've been obsessed with this new video. Okay. Which is not plant-related, but it is nature-related. It is about the sun. Oh, I love the sun. I love the sun, too. I mean, I guess it is plant-related because we can't have plants without the sun. I mean, it's kind of everything-related. We couldn't have anything without the sun. That's true. That's true. But the Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope from the uh, National Observatory produced the highest resolution video and photos of the sun ever. And the video is mesmerizing and you've got to check it out we'll have a link in the show notes if you haven't seen it already there's it's just about a 15 second video of what looks sort of like this hot boiling gas and each of these little boiling blobs on the video is about the size of texas i mean they're yeah they're massive and well the sun is massive yeah and each of these little cells is massive and it's just you know we see this big white dot in the sky right and this is just sort of this close-up, detailed movement of this plasma gas and fire uh, out here on this giant ball of fire in space. It's amazing. That sounds so cool. It's really cool. Uh, we'll have a link in the show notes if you haven't checked it out. We're glad that you're here and excited about agriculture. Be excited about space, too. Space is cool. Space is so cool. All right. Da-da-da-da-da-da. Nature fact. Asexual Reproduction. Oh, yes. Okay. Production so, without sex. Exactly. Or, as you put it earlier, cloning. So, this happens naturally in nature, which is kind of where we got the idea to do it. So, real quick, the banana is 
a clone, right? All bananas are clones of one another. Yes. Is that something we did or is that something that the banana did itself? So bananas do do that. Um, we basically selected for the banana we wanted. Okay. And then propagated that a lot. Got it. Okay. But bananas like just also do do that. Sorry. Still reading my book. Got to know. <laughs> so examples of natural occurrences of asexual propagation includes things like tubers, rhizomes, bulbs, corms, tuberous roots, kikis. That's a lot of words. So I feel like I know what a tuber is. Yeah. That's example, a potato. Exactly. That is a potato. I feel like I know what a root is. That's yeah. A part of a plant. I don't know why it's in this example, but you also said corm. Corms. Which is not corn. No, corms. Corm. And kikis. Yes. And rhizomes and bulbs. I have a friend named Kiki. <laughs> I don't know what it is here. Uh, we talked about rhizomes once. Which is? So it's a kind of root, sort of. Modified stem tissue, yes. Modified stem tissue. I almost said modified root. Modified stem tissue. But it's usually underground, right? And it sort of shoots out and new things kind of sprout out of it. Yeah. It's kind of like either right below or right on top of the ground. It's like kind of what grass has. Yes. Yeah. That's rhizomes. Bulbs, an example is like onions, irises, yes. garlic. Those are bulbs. Your grandmother used to get bulbs all the time and grow them. Right. Corm tulips. Yeah, tulips. Yeah, corms are very similar um, to bulbs. So we'll just say they're basically the same as bulbs. And then tuberous roots, tuberous meaning akin to a tuber. They're slightly different because technically they're root tissue, whereas tubers are stem tissue. But other than that, they're very similar. So like boober tubers. Bubo, bubo tubers. I don't know. Harry Potter reference. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so do you know how we propagate potatoes? We put them under the sink until they sprout little leaves on them? Basically, yeah. So Wait, on really? Well, kind of, but not really. Uh, on potatoes, you have the little eyes, which is where if you leave them out for too long, they'll start to grow. So you can just take like a sharp knife and cut those eyes out and you leave them for a bit of time. Sometimes you put some sulfur powder on them and then you plant them and they grow. That sounds so violent. Why? You cut their eyes out. Yeah, you cut their eyes out. <laughs> cut their eyes out. Yeah. Then you put some sulfur on them. Yeah. And then they grow. Is it pure sulfur or is it a, a mineral, like a salt? Yeah, it's like a mineral salt. Okay. Yeah. You don't always put it on there depending on like how wet it is. The sulfur can help prevent bacterial infections if it gets really wet, but oh, okay. it's not always necessary. You also do have things like kikis. Kiki is specifically a term for orchids, but uh, it's basically what we call an adventitious root. Um, we have it on other things too. So have you ever seen like a spider plant? Do you know what a spider plant is? You've said so many things that I just don't know about. I mean, I know I've seen an orchid. Yes. I did not know they were clones of each other. Well, they're uh, not always, right? They do have flowers and so they can grow seeds. And then I know you didn't, you said something that sounded like advantageous. Adventitious. Adventitious. Adventitious roots. Okay. Have you seen a spider plant before? Do you know a spider plant? I don't remember. So spider plants uh, have like these long, thin leaves, but they also like shoot out little babies. They're very common. <laughs> <laughs> They're like one of them. <laughs> they got little leaves with little babies flying out. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Okay. They're a very common house plant. If you Google a picture of them, you might have seen them somewhere. But they are a very common plant that it's very obvious that they have adventitious root tissue. Basically, you have above ground plant stuff. And they start to grow roots in hopes that they will take root somewhere. The tissue that's above the ground grows the roots in hopes that the roots will find the ground again. Yes. Okay. Exactly. That is adventitious. Yes. Yeah. So like for the spider plants, how they do this is like you have a one big main plant and sometimes they will flower and grow seed, but they prefer to grow clonally. So they'll shoot out these little babies on these like little stems that go like, pew. Wah, wah. Yeah. It's still attached to the plant, but on the bottom so on the top part of the babies are leaves, and then on the bottom there's like a little bit of root tissue. And so if you shoot the baby out and it lands on the ground, it starts to grow on its own. Cool. Yeah. So that's what adventitious root tissue is. When we are propagating plants for our uses, oftentimes we will take cuttings. So a good example of this is like the potatoes. Like we were talking about, you just cut them up, and you're basically separating them and creating a new plant from a smaller part of a plant. But we can also create plants from cuttings by inducing root growth the same way that it kind of happens naturally with these kikis and these spider plants we can take a cutting of something like a pothos ivy and then induce root growth so like you did that remember with jerry yes i took the you know leaf 
above i believe you said it was above the nodule node yeah node, yeah okay so you took like it, i think it was two nodes of a pothos plant yep so and i put that in water mm-hmm. and how did that induce because i didn't do anything right so you know when, when you say induce root growth that makes me think that i should be doing something yeah so oftentimes that is how it works pothos ivy is just very happy to just kind of do whatever and so they just kind of do their own thing with many plants you have to add some kind of hormone so there are five major hormones that plants have and one of them is called auxin and auxin controls root growth if you take a piece of a plant and you put a little auxin on there then it's more likely to grow some roots for you because you're kind of signaling with these hormones like hey here's the place for the roots do the auxin have yolks oh my god (laughs) oh my god (laughs) That was like the worst joke <laughs> you've ever made. <laughs> you said oxen. I thought about, you know, babe, the blue ox out plowing mm-hmm, the field. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, of course, you also mm-hmm. said induce mm-hmm. root growth. Mm-hmm. And it made me think of Pitocin for inducing labor. But I guess, you know, in the broadest sense, the concept's not dissimilar. Um, I guess, yeah, in the very broadest of senses. I mean, you're giving a some sort of ho- hormone yeah. to get things going yeah get things going that's very true if you would like to do cutting at home of any plant uh we advise that you use a sharp knife we meaning like the larger plant community i guess you want to use a sharp knife because one it's safer for you and two you're less likely to have any issues with like bacterial infection or fungal infection or something like that if your plant is less wounded So if you get a nice sharp cut, it's very similar to like people. Like if you use a rusty old knife, you know, to like do a surgery, it's not going to be as good as if you have a clean, sharp knife. So you want a clean, sharp knife. You want to cut the base of your cutting at 45 degrees. This maximizes the area of exposed like stem tissue on the inside, like the inside gooey bits that touch rooting hormones. If you cut it at 45 degrees, you have more surface area than if you cut it straight across. So you get more rooting hormone contact. You also give it more room to build up starches and build up what we call callus tissue, which is meristematic, meaning able to differentiate into other plant organs. Got to maximize the gooey parts. Yeah. Maximize gooey parts by cutting at 45 degrees for many reasons. Cool. Yeah. You can cut many different things. You can also layer. Uh, What do you mean? So layering is also kind of like the spider plant in that. So here's what here's what you do. Imagine this. Imagine you have a bush. You can picture it? Yep. Okay. So you have a bush. You take one of the stems. About midway up the stem, you take all the leaves off for like a two-inch section. You take the stem, you pull it down to the ground, and you bury that part that you took the leaves off of under the ground. You just you don't break the stem off. You just kind of bend it down. And bury it. Yeah. Okay. And then you let it grow for like two months, and then you cut it off. When, and it's got the roots on it. So the parts where the leaves come out turn into parts where the roots come out, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Wow. And, and you can put oxen on that part when you bend it down and put it under the ground. Okay. To tell them these, these, this is roots area now. Yoked oxen. Oh, my God. And then you cut the top of the stem off and then that sticks up and becomes a new bush. Yeah. It's like a whole separate plant. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's amazing. It's very cool. You can also do air layering, which is where, like, if you have a tree, you, like, cut into the tree to, like, wound it, and then you put a little oxen on there, and then you, like, put some potting soil that is damp on it, and then just wrap it in saran wrap and wait a couple weeks, and then you can just cut the whole branch off. Just to be clear. Yeah. This only works with plants. Yeah, it would not work with people. Right. Yeah. You cannot bury... Never mind. Nope. Okay. <laughs> nope. 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 <laughs> so that's layering. It's very similar to cutting, except for the plant stays attached until the end of the process. Like the last step is cutting it off. We also do have micro propagation. Oh boy. Sort of like micro greens, only with propagation, not greens. It's wild. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, it, this is like in a very controlled clean room situation, like you're in like a lab. So. Not the wild kind of wild, but the crazy kind of wild. Like the crazy kind of wild where it's just like wild. It's like buck wild. Okay. So you take a very, very small part of a plant. It can be leaf tissue. It can be stem tissue. It's not usually root tissue because it's harder to get leaves to grow from roots than it is to get roots to grow from leaves. And you have to have both parts to get a whole plant. And basically you take a very small amount of it. 
like probably like if you were to imagine like if you did like a hole puncher on a leaf like that amount wow so just a tiny bit of plant tissue a small bit of plant tissue and you basically put it in a grow room and it grows a whole new plant you don't have to do anything to it i mean you do so you put it in agar and the agar usually has like some oxen it's basically like in a little petri dish and then once it's like grown up a little bit where it's like big enough where you're able to like pull it out then you can pull it out and put it in like some potting soil and then you put that in like a grow room with lights and water and yeah I feel like the oxen would have to be really tiny to put in the Petri dish. Not. This is not a good joke. (laughs) This is not a good joke. (laughs) I'm not engaging with this. All right. You take a whole bunch, punch a hole in a leaf, you put it, the little piece of plant confetti Mm -hmm. in the Petri dish, Mm -hmm. and you make a new plant from it. Yes. That is pretty wild. It's buck wild. Yeah, it's very cool. We do it a lot for science. Sometimes we do it for like woody plants where you have a very high market value because it's like expensive to have like grow rooms and stuff like that. And you also need much more specialized labor. Like you could probably layer a bush. Like you kind of understand the process. You could go out, bury part of a branch and get a new plant. Right. But like to work in a lab and to really handle those chemicals, it's a lot of infrastructure. You need specialized labor. It's more expensive. So we do it for science. We do it for things that are more expensive so that you can like afford to, Spend more to get like really clean, good plants. So I have two thoughts. One is this means in that tiny bit of plant, Mm -hmm. there's enough information for an entire new plant. Yes. So we there's a concept for that, actually. It's called totopotency. And it's like the idea that from one cell, you could grow a whole plant. That's an amazing term. Yeah. The plant's got totopotency. Totopotency. Okay, that's awesome. From one cell. Yeah, that's the concept. So my other thought is, I assume it has, but has this not worked for the American chestnut? Ah, uh, no. So the problem with the American chestnut is not that we can't grow more chestnut trees. It's that if we do grow more chestnut trees, then there is like fungus that will then still get to them. So it's more an issue of like breeding with the chestnuts than just like growing more of them. That this fungal blight is just so ubiquitous that it's we're having a hard time getting resistance into the actual species. Got it. Yeah. Well, cool. Now we know how to make new plants. Yeah. Do you feel educated? I do feel educated. Do you feel like you should have taken a whole semester to learn all of this? I don't know. Melissa, let us know what you think. I bet you knew all of this stuff already. <laughs> and I bet everyone in plant propagation this semester can listen to this episode and get A's. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe so. All right. Knock, knock. Who's there? Petri dish. Petri dish who? There's oxen in your Petri dish. And you said mine was a bad joke? I'll leave the jokes to you. Fine. (laughs) Fine. (laughs) It was was off the cuff, okay? So were mine. (laughs) Thanks for listening to this episode of One to Grow On. If you'd like to support the show, please write and review us on iTunes and consider donating to our Patreon at patreon.com slash one to grow on pod. If you'd like to connect with us, find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Tumblr at one to grow on pod. This show is hosted by me, Hallie Casey, and Chris Casey. It's produced by Catherine RJ and Hallie Casey. Our music is Something Elated by Broke for Free, and our show art is by Mariah Coley. Be sure to check out the next episode in two weeks. But until then, keep on growing. Bye, everybody. <laughs>